Well, thank you all so much for inviting me today. And I, please give a round of applause for Wadia for making those videos. Of course, she was struggling with some of the recipes because I gave her original recipes from the 1860s. Their measurements are different than our measurements, so she did a little struggle trying to figure all that out. She sent me a couple of emails. I could tell she was tearing her hair out in the kitchen. Um, now, my lecture, some of it's going to be based on uh, one of my books I published called The Bourbon Barons, um, but we'll roll into this real quickly. Now, during the U.S. Civil War, Christmas dinners were not as elaborate as they are today. Many families were struggling financially and food was scarce, so they had to make do with what they had on hand. However, some traditional Christmas foods that were on the table included roast pork or beef, potatoes, root vegetables such as carrots, turnips, cabbage, or collard greens, and the traditional apple or pumpkin pie that we're used to. Now, during the Civil War, Christmas celebrations were not as widespread since many soldiers and civilians were focused on the war effort. Additionally, the ability of certain foods varied depending on the region and the time of the war, because it was a little bit different in 1861 than it was in 1865 due to the abundance of resources, especially in the South. And this is an original Harper's Weekly from 1860, just before the Civil War. You can see the grain feast on the table there and some other Christmas scenes around it. You can see Santa Claus off to the left. Um, and then you can see warming up fire, the balls. And of course, if you'll notice, the Christmas tree in the upper right, it's actually on a table. Back then, they were not on the floors yet. Well, a pre-war pre Southern Christmas dinner might include baked ham, turkey, oysters, and winter vegetables from the root cellar, squash, cabbage, potatoes, sweet potatoes, carrots, and apples. Preserves, pickles, relishes, breads, pies, and puddings would also be added to the table. Over the years, some foods have become synonymous with the Christmas season, such as mince pies, eggnog, and plum pudding. Now, as for the soldiers, both Confederate and Union, the hospitals try to bring the homestead traditional Christmas dinner to the soldiers. Confederate nurse Kate Cummings was up before daylight making eggnog for the patients in the hospital where she worked. She could not find enough eggs to serve everyone, so the holiday treat was given to the wounded, the cooks, and the nurses. One of the doctors provided turkey, chickens, vegetables, and pies. But Kate's enjoyment was dampened by the thought that the men on the battlefield had not fared so well. In Georgia, Julia Johnson Fisher wrote of the Christmas of 1864, quote, On Christmas Day we fared sumptuously. Mrs. Lynn dined with us and furnished a turkey. We had some chickens and a piece of fresh pork. Gussie had been off 10 miles and brought oysters. So we had an oyster stew and chicken salad minus the greens, potatoes, and rice. The turkey was dressed with cornbread. Our dessert was a cornmeal pudding. Oh, how we did relish it. We are always hungry, hungry the year round, but do not grow fat. During the Christmas 1862, due to the Battle of Perryville, which you folks probably know, I don't know nothing about that battle, mm -hmm. and Morgan's Christmas raid, the hospitals in Louisville and further north in Jeffersonville, Indiana, were full of wounded and sick soldiers. In nearly all of the hospitals, there was an extra setup for the Christmas dinner, but no attempts were made to display the Christmas feast. An entry from a diary recalls that Christmas Day in Louisville in 1862. And I quote, November, excuse me, hospital number 11, Louisville, Kentucky, December 25th, 1862. A number of ladies living in this part of town, headed by Mrs. Davis, and Mrs. Gardner and Mrs. Osborne made up a fine dinner. At least it was fine for us. There wasn't any turkey and chickens enough for all, so it was given to those who couldn't get out, and the rest of us took what was left, and it was plenty. At night, someone sneaked in a bottle or two, and some of the men had been in town and gotten it. Consequently, there was a good deal of racket and noise, 
But on account of it being Christmas, Dr. Strew let it pass. In South Carolina, Emma Holmes described her holiday dinner as consisting of a ham, a gift from a friend, a turkey she had raised, and bread pudding sweetened with sorghum, a delicious meal for the times. But she could not enjoy it for worrying about her family members that were in the army, who probably had little or nothing to eat. As the Civil War dragged on, deprivation replaced the well-set table, and family fit faces were missing from the dinner table. On Christmas Day in 1864, a special dinner was served to 4,500 Union soldiers housed at the Satterley General Hospital, then the largest hospital in the country. Satterley was located in Philadelphia between 40th and 44th Streets near Baltimore Avenue in a sparsely developed area about a half mile west of the Salt Hill River. The sprawling 15-acre facility comprised rows of wood frame wards and hundreds of tents as well as a library, a reading room, and a printing shop that probably produced this menu with an illustration of a hospital on the back. Now, the holiday dinner shown above, which I'll go back one, as you can see, the holiday dinner shown below was provided by Mr. and Mrs. Milton Egbert, whose farm in northwest Pennsylvania was luckily situated in the center of the nation's first oil producing region. In 1859, the, er, the uh, early wells yielded only a few thousand barrels, but oil production quickly grew during the Civil War, making the Egberts immensely, immensely wealthy. <laughs> At the time, it was said that no parcel of land in the United States of equal size had yielded a larger financial return than their farm on Oil Creek. Saturday was closed after the Civil War and ended in 1865. During its four-year existence, more than 50,000 wounded soldiers were treated at the hospital, where a remarkable record was achieved in saving lives. On Christmas Day of 1862, a grateful nation showed its appreciation for the sacrifices of the U.S. Army with dinners for thousands of sick and wounded soldiers in military hospitals in and near the nation's capital. President Lincoln, the First Lady, attended the event one of the more extraordinary of its kind during the Civil War. Quote, nowhere else in the world than America, a New York newspaper report, said could have the site which has made this holiday in Washington remarkable and memorable, the banqueting of 35,000 wounded and sick soldiers upon a Christmas dinner spread by the hands of individual benevolence. Food came throughout the Union, Pennsylvania, Maryland, shipped an immense amount of poultry. Ever generous Albany, New York provided 300 turkeys cooked and ready to eat. Four carloads, and I'm talking not car, beep, beep, I'm talking train carloads of poultry arrived from Chicago. Volunteers served the feast in hospital wards decorated with Christmas trees, evergreens, green holly, crimson berries, wreaths, and red roses. Quote, the whole was prepared in a style to please the most epicurean taste, a newspaper wrote, about the fair served at the College Hospital in Georgetown. Topped with flowers, a pyramid of seven large cakes stood near the door of the hospital near the Potomac River. Dessert included ice cream at least at one of the dinners. At the Judiciary Square Hospital, which accompanied 500 patients, the scene was especially immense. In the dining hall, stacks of chickens and turkeys formed a, quote, perfect pyramid. One of the gobblers reported weighed 25 pounds. The fare also consisted of roast beef, mutton, hams, oysters, chickens, side dishes of all sorts, and of course, pies. Mary Lincoln, the president's wife, contributed food for the dinner at the contraband on Christmas Day. At 2 p.m., volunteers served Christmas dinner at the Contraband at 12th and Q Streets, the temporary home of about 500 escaped slaves and other African Americans. The feast included turkey, chicken, roast beef, boiled ham, vegetables, and candy, mostly contributed by Mary Lincoln herself. Afterward, each child received a toy. Earlier that morning, volunteers distributed clothing to the grateful adults and children. Now, eggnog, which we had some today, 
Although originally a drink of the English upper classes, eggnog had achieved a renaissance of sorts when it reached the 13 colonies many centuries before. Ample land for dairy cows and chickens made milk, cream, and eggs more readily accessible to people of all means, while the triangle trade brought in massive quantities of cheap sugar and rum, and of course, human slaves. Those ingredients form the backbone of the recipe for eggnog, though if you're present at George Washington, your eggnog would be a bit heavier on the booze. <laughs> His recipe famously requires a strong dose of rye whiskey and Jamaican rum and sherry. Wow. Originally a post-set in Europe, particularly England, was a hot drink made of milk curdled with wine or ale. The drink was beaten to smooth out the texture, spices, and sugar were added, as Wadia really knows about now. And by the 16th century, cream replaced milk. Once the recipe jumped across the Atlantic, colonists and later Americans began adding eggs to the mixture, which started to be served cold. Several references exist concerning how to serve an eggnog to the patients in the hospitals during the Civil War. Eggnog as, quote, more akin to a protein shake, providing a nutritional boost to patients. And eggnog's health benefits were believed to go beyond just nourishment. On December 31st of 1859, an editorial in the Chicago Press and Tribune lamented how the politicians in the U.S. House of Representatives were not immune to the charms of holiday eggnog. Quote, eggnog has ruled the country today. It is a famous drink in public and private houses in Washington on Christmas, and some of the members, in spite of it, reached the house today at noon, and some, in consequence of it, did not get there at all. <laughs> Another popular drink during the Civil War were punches, mulled wines, and the very elusive abstinent and sangrias. Alcohol were used, such as brandy, rum, champagne, wines, sherry, whiskey, bourbon, and gin. And this, the recipes that I'm showing you in the slides here came from this book. It was published in 1862 and it was called How to Mix Drinks. And it's about 150 pages. <laughs> now, bourbon, bourbon producers, and this is where I'm going to tie in where the guys that actually supplied the booze to these parties. I'm going to show you a couple other recipes here. Here's the shoulder sh strap champagne punch. One quart bottle of champagne, sugar, oranges, lemons, pineapples, raspberry, or strawberry syrup. That doesn't sound too bad, actually. <laughs> There's Verena's Tea Punch, which was supposed to be served hot. You can see it's got, look at all the liquors, brandy, rum, lump sugar, and a large lemon. Wee dummies. Now we're going to go into this gentleman. The first uh, bourbon producer I'm going to talk about that came from Louisville, uh, had offices here, was John McDougall Atherton who was born in LaRue County, Kentucky on April 1st of 1841. His parents was Peter Atherton and Elizabeth Mayfield Atherton. His father was a native of Virginia and moved to Kentucky when he was a Virginian land grant of over a thousand acres, the year before Kentucky was admitted as a state. His maternal grandfather was Alexander McDougall, who was a soldier under General George Washington during the American Revolution. From about 1800 to 1830, Peter built and operated a log distillery on the west bank of the Knob Creek. When he was three years old, John's father died, leaving him the estate. His mother married Marshall Key. Now, John attended the public schools until he was 10 years old, when his parents sent him to Bardstown, Kentucky to learn an education. After attending the school in Bardstown for about three years, he entered Georgetown College in Georgetown, Kentucky. In 1861, he was married to Mar uh, Maria Farnham of Georgetown, who was the daughter of Jonathan Farnham, a professor at Georgetown College. In 1862, he had one son, Peter. John did not graduate from Georgetown due to his ill health. Now, after regaining his health in 1867 with the financial help of his stepfather, Marshall, John built a new distillery on the banks of Knob Creek and named the whiskey after himself. Marshall Key and John Atherton became joint owners of the Atherton Distillery. In 1869, he purchased an interest in a small distillery 
and moved his distillery to the east bank of the Knob Creek, according to the first, according uh, his first distillery, and placed his cousin Alexander Mayfield in charge of the plant, calling his new endeavor the Mayfield Distillery. Now he entered, he created a village for his workers in both plants and called his village Athertonville, which was located about two miles from New Haven, Kentucky. He built his own depot and built two miles of railroad tracks to connect the distilleries with the main line in order to take his product to New Haven. He also built a large store known as the Fair. He also built the Atherton Hotel in the 1890s in his Athertonville. In 1873, at the age of 19, he moved to Louisville and studied law at the Louisville Law School. His health turned for the worse, and he had to move back to his parents' farm for a short time. From about 1869 to 1871, he served as a member of the state legislature and was a chairman of the Democratic State Central Committee. In 1881, he was elected a member of the Board of Directors for the National Bank of Kentucky and later elected to serve as vice president and eventually president. Now, Cochran and Fulton, who were wholesale dealers in Louisville, purchased Marshall Key, his half of the interest in the Atherton and Mayfield Distillery, and became partners with John Atherton in the production and sell whiskey. Cochran and Fulton became partners in the Mayfield Distillery, and in 1875, Cochran and Fulton and Atherton ran both distilleries. Cochran and Fulton continued to run their wholesale liquor business in Louisville, but in 1880, Atherton became a partner in their com company, and the name was changed to Cochran, Fulton, and Atherton. In 1880, Atherton gave Cochran and Fulton one half of interest in the Mayfield Distillery, and Cochran and Fulton and Atherton decided to build two other distilleries. By 1882, Atherton had built four distilleries which had the largest capacity of any company in the entire United States. They were Atherton, A. Mayfield, William Miller, and the S. O'Brien. William Miller was the Atherton's bookkeeper of two distilleries. O'Brien was their distiller, and Maxie was a railroad agent at New Haven. Miller, O'Brien, and Maxie all owned one-sixth interest in the company. The brands that they made were the Atherton, the Windsor, the Mayfield, the Clifton. The first two were sweet mash whiskeys, and the second two were sour mash brands. His brands expanded to over 10 different labels, including Old Indian River Rye, Howard, Kenwood, Brownfield, Baker, and Carter Whiskey. The buildings and attached premises covered an area of over 30 acres, and they employed over 150 workers. When the distilleries were in full production, they consumed 1,800 bushels of grain a day, and they produced between 18,000 to 20,000 barrels of whiskey annually. He also owned his own cooperage, which employed from about 20 to 25 skilled workers. He used, below this, 600,000 staves yearly for making the barrels. At the time, Atherton Distilleries were the only distillery in the state to produce exclusively pure rye whiskey, and the first to make a move in the direction of rye whiskey. At the height of his distillery, Atherton was the largest producer of sour mash in the world. When he moved to Louisville, he bought the, brought the offices of his distilleries with him and sold his products to all parts of the country through the Louisville office. And if you've been to Cave Hill Cemetery, that is his grave. And by 1882, Atherton installed his partnership with Cochran and Fulton. He also ended the partnership with the company that was named Cochran, and Fulton, and Atherton. Um, and then in 1899, he decided to sell his distillery, which was at that time one of the largest and most modern plants in Kentucky, to a corporation known as the Kentucky Distillers and Warehouse Company, also known as the Whiskey Trust. If you want to talk about a bunch of gangsters, read my book. You'll learn about more about these guys. Uh, when he sold his business, his whiskey was worth $1 million. You're like, well, big whoop. No, back then, that was $26 million. According to the newspaper, he sold his entire stock of 75,000 barrels of whiskey. Uh, he gave up his residence at the southeast corner of 3rd and Broadway and sold his offices on Main Street. He built his new house for $50,000 and was designed by Charles Clark. Before Atherton built his house on the site, Captain Silas Miller had built a home on the site. Atherton finally sold his home in 1902 
And in 1911, unfortunately, his home was demolished to make room for the Weisinger Galbert Building. He had 40 acres of land on his country estate, which was directly east of Eastern Parkway, and stated to a local newspaper he was going to raise just stock and poultry. He made real estate investments on property at the southwest corner of 4th and Chestnut, which were occupied by the Francis Building, the southeast corner of 4th and Walnut, now Muhammad Ali Streets, and the building erected for the Lincoln Bank and Trust Company. He was the first president of the Lincoln Savings and Bank Trust Company. In 1884, he was made director of the Louisville Gas Company, and in 1898, he was elected to the board of the directors for the Louisville-Nashville Railroad. He was also the director of the Louisville Realty Company. He also had an interest in education. In 1884, he became a member of the Board of Education. He was instrumental in having the old school trustee law abolished from Louisville and the Louisville school system put up what was known as what we know today, the Board of Education. In 1893, he made a $30,000 donation to Georgetown College and stated in his letter to the president of the college that the minute money was to be used as an endowment to be named after Atherton Franham, Chair of Natural Science. He stated that the uh, education in the college was to be mostly in dedicated to his wife's father, who spent almost nearly 50 years as a professor at Georgetown. In 1910, he served as chairman of the Board of Trade. In 1921, suspending a, he suspended a rule forbidding the naming of a school after a living person. So the Board of Education decided to name the proposed new girls' school on Morton Avenue at Rubel after Atherton. Atherton was also one of the found out founders of the Pendennis Club. He was also a founding member of the Louisville Jockey Club, which later became Churchill Downs. He was also a former member of the Louisville Country Club. Yes, he was. <laughs> as many guys are going to notice, that not only my Bourbon book, but also my Gilded Age book, they had their toes in everything. Um, on May 30th, 1932, he came down with pneumonia and died several days later on Sunday night, June 5th, 1932, at his home at 2542 Ransdale Avenue. His funeral was held at his home and services were conducted by Reverend Dean Richard McReady of the Christian Church Cathedral. Um, let me show you here. Look at his son. He died in Solomon Islands. This gentleman here, this is Henry McKenna. Now, Henry McKenna was bound, uh, born in County Derry, Ireland on January 9, 1819. He moved to America when he was 21 years old. He worked in central Kentucky as a turnpike builder and settled in Fairfield after the building the, of the road from Fairfield to Bloomfield. In 1855, he built his distillery. He learned distillery from Ireland. He began to manufacture whiskey on a small scale in an old shed making less than one barrel a day. He made sure that his whiskey was of a superior quality and he soon discontinued his flour mill and focused mainly on his distillery. When the Civil War ended, he increased the capacity of his distillery to a little more than a barrel a day. In 1883, he built a new brick distillery, increasing the capacity to three barrels a day, while still maintaining the quality. The method used to make his McKenna Sour Mash Whiskey was described in 1896 by Samuel Carpenter Elliott in the Nelson County Record and reprinted later in the Kentucky Standard. And the quote is, the corn used is first thoroughly examined. The tip ends where rotten grain is most to be found is examined and these diseased grains are shelled off by hand. When this is done, the corn is put into a sheller and afterwards thoroughly fanned. So is the malt and the rye. By this means, there is nothing allowed to be put into the mash but pure grain. Everything around the premises denotes cleanliness and clockwork management. The small, old-fashioned mash tubs are placed upon a contrivance, and after attaching a rope to it, all are pulled into position. When one man pours water into the tub through a rubber hose, another stirs the meal and draws it into the opening, which carries the mash into a stirring machine where it is finally conveyed through wooden channels into the fermenting tubs to undergo the required fermenting period before ready for use. The warehouse are built upon a rock foundation are well ventilated and conveniently arranged. They have a capacity of 8,000 barrels. 
There's one thing that can be said of another in Kentucky. That is, they never sell their whiskey and bond until it is more than three years old. McKenna's plant was located 11 miles northeast of Bardstown and four miles west of Bloomfield on State Highway 48. He also uh, ran a 500-acre farm that grew his grains using his distillery. Henry McKenna gave his whiskey a worldwide reputation. If he heard of a dealer diluting his whiskey or when his supply ran out, selling another whiskey as the McKenna brand, he would not do business with that dealer ever again. He was a devout Catholic and was noted for his liberality, and he did aid to whoever he could. His son continued to run the business, uh, Daniel McKenna, and uh, James also continued the warehouse business, and Stafford, another son, was the traveling businessman. Uh, his son, James McKenna, lived at 6th and Kentucky Streets in Louisville with his office at 245 4th Street. His only daughter, Mary McKenna, lived with her father and attended to the upkeep of the house. On February 22, 1893, he died at the home of Fairfield, Nelson County. His wife, Elizabeth, had died several years earlier in 1880. Now, they continued to run their distillery for about 25 years, but when Prohibition uh, hit, it basically went under. In 1934, after Prohibition, um, operations resumed in the McKenna plant, and James McKenna became president of the distillery. Stafford McKenna died in 1935 at St. Joe's. Um, his funeral was held in Fairfield, and he was buried in the St. Michael Cemetery. He had six daughters. James died on December 17, 1941, at his home of his son-in-law, Dr. M. J. Henry, on one, or 1226 Summit Avenue in Louisville. Now, in 1941, the Distillers Corporation of Seagrams bought the Henry McKenna Incorporated for $950,000. James McKenna, former president, Dr. Henry J. McKenna, former executive vice president, and their associates sold all their stock. Heaven Hill Distillery in Bardstown, Kentucky, continues to make Henry McKenna bourbon to this day. And there's his grave, and just right outside of Nelson County. There's one of the famous containers. And the next one we're going to talk about, and this will be the last one, this is Paul Jones. Now, Paul Jones Jr. was born in Lynchburg, Virginia on September 6, 1840. During the Civil War, Paul Jones Jr. and his two sons, Paul Jr. and Warner Jones, supported the Confederacy. Both Paul Jones Jr. and Warner Paul enlisted in the Confederate Army. Warner became a colonel and fought in the Battle of Perryville on October 8th. Warner Jones died during the Siege of Land in 1864. After the Civil War, Paul Jones Sr., along with Paul Jones Jr., moved to Atlanta, where they both became successful in the whiskey business. Uh, Paul Jones Sr. died in 1877. In 1883, a strong temperance movement brought prohibition to Georgia. So Paul Jones Jr. moved to Tennessee, where he continued to grow the whiskey business as brokers for various distillers. In 1884, Paul Jones decided to move to Louisville, Kentucky. And in 1888, the Jones bought assets from whiskey maker R.M. Rose, who claimed to name his bourbon after Jones's daughters. In another version of the story, the name Four Roses was based on Rose, his brother, and their two sons. You choose whichever one you want. Jones acquired the Four Roses name along with the other Roses assets and operated their company until the name of Paul Jones Company, which was located on 136 and 138 Main Street on Whiskey Row in Louisville. The building was four stories tall with a basement. He handed all the leading brands of fine Kentucky bourbon and sour mash whiskeys and carried large stocks in store and bonded warehouses. In addition to hand handling fine products from Kentucky, he also handled the superior Pennsylvania rye whiskeys manufactured by Haynes, Moore, and Sinnott, uh, successors to John Gibson's Son & Company, who were recognized as the leading brands of Pennsylvania rye. Jones was recognized as one of the most prominent men identified with distilling and wholesale whiskey trade. Uh, Jones became president of the J.G. Manigley Company on 19th and High Streets. He was also director and vice president of the American National Bank, who was also a member of the Board of Trade and also director of the National Building and Loan Association. 
1892, Paul Jones registered the Four Roses trademark, and his name and brand became known throughout the country. He believed in advertising, and in New York, he rented a space on a building at Madison Square for a sign of incandescent electric lights at a cost of $1,200. <laughs> now, Paul Jones Jr. never married and made his residence for a number of years at the Colt House. He died on February 23, 1895, in Louisville from, quote unquote, absences of the brain. He was surrounded at his deathbed by his three nephews, Lawrence, Sanders, and Bland Ballard Jones. When he died, he was known to one of the most wealthiest and most widely known distillers in Kentucky. There's his business. And there's his grave at Cave Hill Cemetery. Um, he, this is one of the largest mausoleums in Cave Hill, from what I understand. And uh, that's because he's one of the board of directors on Cave Hill, too. <laughs> Look at that beautiful stained glass window. That was made by Tiffany's. Now, one thing I want to point out here uh, before I wrap this up, I just want to say his funeral was held at the Calvary Church. The flower arrangements were profuse and many were in handsome designs. Among them was a large shaft of wheat signifying he lived to be 70 years old and a broken wagon wheel. The remains were taken to Cave Hill Cemetery where they were temporarily placed in a public vault until a mausoleum could be built. The casket, and folks, if you wanted to try to take it with you, he gave it a good shot. Uh, the casket was made of the most expensive and handsome caskets in the city at that time. The casket was made of solid red cedar covered with an imported broadcloth. The handles were oxidized silver and the knobs were solid gold. His mausoleum vault is of a Greek revival and inside is the beautiful stained glass window that I showed you. His nephews Lawrence and Sander Jones continued to run the family business. Jones' relatives bought thousands of barrels of bourbon and brokered them. Now, Prohibition changed the focus of the company when they made medicinal whiskey. After Prohibition, Paul Jones' company bought the Frankfurt Distilleries, where the company bottled Paul Jones and Old Prentice, named after George Prentice, until World War II, when in 1943, Canadian distiller Joseph Seagram and Sons Incorporated purchased the Frankfurt Distilleries of Paul Jones and Company and other distilleries, including Atherton Distillery, McKenna, Old Princess, etc. Seagram moved to the Four Roses brand in Europe and then to Asia, but in 2002, the Kieran Brewery Company brought the Four Roses bourbon trademark and production facilities back to the U.S. The new company was named Four Roses Distillery LLC, and Four Roses was once again sold in the United States. And Four Roses, in case Christmas is coming up, that is my favorite bourbon. Thank you very much. <laughs> again, thank you all so much for inviting me today. Again, thank you, Maria, for making the cakes. And if I could just make a special announcement, uh, Nick Morris, if you could come up and make a couple announcements here. Good afternoon to 